Okay. Now, Michelle, can you give me screen share rights, please? Yep, I'm just going to do that now too. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's seminar. We have the very lovely Dr. Ka Heng Lee. Dr. Lee is an occupational and environmental medicine specialist, or an OC phys, as we call them casually. Um, we are very proud to have Dr. Lee with us on our MAG panel, and he is available to be booked by you for assessments. He writes a very, very good report, so we're very pleased to have him on board. Uh, may I ask that you keep yourself on mute until uh, an interactive slide comes up where you will be asked to, to contribute if you have something to say. The reason I ask for this is that noise in your home or workplace may interfere with the quality of the recording. So if you could please keep yourself on mute um, until we um, need you to get off mute, uh, then that would be great. At the end of the session, there will be an opportunity to ask some questions of Dr. Lee. Um, so please feel free to do that. If you have to go before the end of the session for whatever reason and you have a question, you can type it into the chat function and uh, I will ask that question for you. You will receive the recording uh, within a day of the session finishing anyway, so you can then see the answer to your question if you've missed out on it. And of course, as with all of our seminars, this will be saved up to our YouTube channel so you can access it again at any time as well as any other seminars that you uh, couldn't attend or didn't even know about but would like to see. Dr. Lee actually did one of our Meet the Specialist sessions for us, and that's up there on the YouTube channel for you to view. So without further ado, uh, over to you, Dr. Lee, and thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for giving me your time and attention today. Now, I'll just start up my screen share. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that all right. Now, as Michelle has said before, my name is Dr. Kai Li. I'm an occupational and environmental physician. And just a little bit about my background so you know who's talking to you. These are my qualifications and lots of people always wonder what all these actually mean. Now, this is a Bachelor of Medical Science. This is a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. This is a graduate diploma of occupational and environmental physician. And this one's a, a huge mouthful. It's a fellow of the Australasian Faculty of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, which is a faculty of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Now, what does that all mean? It basically just means I'm a fully qualified specialist occupational and environmental physician. The RACP, the R, which stands for royal means that the college is accredited so it is a real college there are so-called colleges or fellowships out there that are basically professional clubs with no real oversight or standards this is royal okay so it is accredited. all right uh, i have worked as an, a full-time occupational medicine doctor since 2012 and my industry experience that is work as the company doctor has included companies like ExxonMobil, which I'm sure everyone has heard of Esso and Mobil, that's who they are. Uh, at various points in time, they have been the biggest company in the entire world. Quenos makes all of the plastic in Australia, well, most of the important plastics. So your milk bottles, recycling bins, that sort of thing is all plastic from Quenos. And Dow Chemical, which has also been one of the largest companies in the world. I've done various types of work, such as injury management, return to work, rehabilitation. I do fitness for duty assessments, independent medical examinations. And I've had exposure to various fields, such as manufacturing, dangerous goods, transportation, warehousing. I won't read out the entire list to you, but as you can see, pretty much if you can think of it, I've had experience in it at some point. I am also the current chair of the a form Victoria and Tasmania Regional Committee. So I organize the educational activities for the other doctors in uh, Victoria and Tasmania, along with, with some help from the other committee members, of course. 
I'm a training supervisor, so I train new specialists in my field. And I have been a Monash, Monash University tutor in the past, uh, but I've just stopped that for this year because I've got it too busy. Now, what is occupational and environmental medicine? Now, the occupational side of it just colloquially refers to the effect of work on health and the effect of health on work. And what does that really mean? Now, the effect of work on health would be something like if you were working as a carpenter and you dropped a hammer on your foot and you broke your toe. That's a situation where your work has affected your health. And the effect of health on work, let's say you were a train driver and you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, and you suffer a heart attack. Now there's a very strong question about whether you can return to driving a train and when you can do that. That's how your health has affected your work. And that is basically, in a nutshell, what occupational medicine is all about. That and all the scenarios surrounding these two main things. Right? The environmental side of it is a niche within a niche. Occupational and environmental medicine itself is already a niche. And environmental medicine is, is e an even smaller part of that body, right? And it has to do with health impacts of industry on the environment. And uh, in the line of work that you do, it's pretty unlikely that you will engage me in anything that has to do with environmental medicine. Uh, maybe if you were a solicitor or a government representative. So one example is the federal government commissioning an occupational and environmental physician to study and publish a report about the health effects of wind farms on the nearby community. We in occupational environmental medicine like to take a holistic view of workers at work. And this is, this is my opinion. We think in positive terms and that's reflected in our memorandum, our stance statement. It is an official document called the health benefits of good work. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that just a bit later. So we strongly focus on what an individual can do. And conversely, if we have studied someone and we've examined them and looked at the history and we conclude that they can't work, it's a pretty safe bet that we have thought about all the bases and they really can't work. So these are the official statements by AFOM, Australia's in Faculty of Occupational Environmental Medicine, about what occupational medicine is. I won't read that out to you. You can Google that. You can look that up on the AFOM website. And that's the official statement on what environmental medicine is. It's just phrased in fancier terms than I used previously. Now, the health benefits of good work. It's an initiative by AFOM. And it's based on Australasian and international evidence that good work is beneficial to people's health and well-being. And long-term work absence, disability, and unemployment have a negative impact on health and well-being. This is the statement. Again, we, we're not going like, to read through it because that'd be a bit silly. You can just look this up if you would like to. But the importance of this is that it defines the entire stance of our field of medicine, okay? We are saying that good work is good for people. And when we say good work, we're talking about, you know, people going to a job that they enjoy, they make good income at, it's safe, it's not causing them harm. So we're not talking about children and coal mines or anything like that. That's clearly going to fall outside the spectrum of good work. If people do good work, it is good for their health. And if you don't keep this in mind as a, as a doctor, as a medical practitioner, there is a tendency to stray and bias towards finding uh, in favor of pleasing your patient, because that is a very natural instinct as a doctor. You want to help people, right? You want to help your patient. And your pa if your patient comes and says, I've got pain in my foot, I can't possibly work ever again. Uh, there's a very natural instinct to protect them and help them and say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you can't work. You have to take a scientific view and keep this firmly in mind that going back to work, even though it's not what they want, is very likely to be good, to, good for them. Okay. So that's, that's the whole basis of occupational environmental medicine right there. So what does an occupational physician do? We do a lot of 
injury management, we do a lot of rehabilitation work, we are engaged in return to work processes. I take part in these things as a company doctor for those companies that I mentioned earlier. We do some government policy work sometimes. We uh, give insurance advice. So there are a number of my colleagues work directly with, uh, say, work cover insurers as an advisor. So they review their cases, they advise case managers and things like that. We do medical legal work. And sometimes we do incident response and consulting projects. So for example, there was a power company where the workers were exposed to a leakage of a certain type of chemical from their transformer products and no one could help them. Uh, they went to the GP, the GP had no idea what it was and how to deal with it. Uh, went to emergency department. The emergency department physicians just said, well, they're not in any danger. We'll discharge the care of their GPs. Uh, and that's when they engaged me on a project so, sort of short-term incident response basis to give them an update on what is it they have been exposed to, what are the short-term ramifications, short-term follow-up, long-term follow-up, and so on. Now, this is a question that's been put to me <clears throat> by other people in the past. How does an occupational physician IME assessment, independent medical examination assessment work? So a lot of this you will be familiar with because it's pretty much the same across all specialties. Your referral and the questions are the driving force. We do the pre-reading, we see what you've sent us, and there's a standardized history template that people go through. So we ask about what happened, we ask about what the current status of your injury or illness is. Th these sections here are where occupational medicine adds on a little bit extra. So we ask about their education, their training, their experience, their qualifications. We ask about their current job requirements, what, what it is they're really expected to do. We ask about their current work status, whether they are actually still working, whether they are modified duties, if there are modified duties, what the restrictions are, who gave them the restrictions, what the plan is, is there a written return to work plan or not, what it is they want to do in the future in terms of their plan for return to work, and so on and so forth. And the rest are pretty standard again, uh, asking about their activities of daily living, their tolerances, their medical history, their social history. Next, we move on to examination. And once again, it's this is pretty stock standard across all uh, specialties. We inspect them, palpate, percuss, auscultate. We check their range of motion. We do special tests. What I like to add on for myself is some functional observations. So what's the best way to see if, uh, let's say, a store person can go back to their job in a warehouse lifting up to 20 kilogram crates what I like to do is I go grab a 20 kilogram grab crate and bring it into the exam room and get them to show me. I'll say, can you transfer this at waist height from here to over there five meters away? Next, I put it down the ground. I'll get you to show me how you would pick this up using correct manual handling technique and lift it to the height of your waist. Next, I'll put it at waist height and say, how would you lift this from waist height to shoulder height? So things like that, I, I like to get them to actually demonstrate to me what they are going to be doing at work. Investigations, we don't typically organize this as the independent medical examiner, but sometimes there are exceptions. Sometimes an investigation is so key that the report's not really going to go too far without that information. And I might flag it with you, the client, or the client might already have written up in their referral letter saying, please organize any investigation you deem necessary, just let us know and we'll pay for it. Um, if there are any invest existing investigations, of course, we take that into account. Then we do a summary of opinion and we answer your schedule of questions. All right, so why would you pick occupational medicine for your assessments? So as I said before, I think that our view tends to take a holistic and pragmatic approach to the assessment. Uh, this varies on an ind individual basis, but we might be more willing to comment on non-anatomical or non-physical factors. So you might very well have a surgeon say to you, I will comment on this broken leg and nothing else. Uh, I typically will take into account things like 
realistically, what are the chances of this person going back to work? Even when you take into account the fact that their broken leg's been repaired, you know. I, so I'm thinking about all these other things here as well. So and that leads me to the next point. So we're not just experts in medical outcomes and medical prognosis. We're experts in vocational outcomes and vocational prognosis. Right, so we'll give you a true understanding of what's likely to happen to this person, not just on a medical basis, but whether they're going to get back to work or not. Because we think about things like blue flags. A blue flag is a psychosocial issue at the individual level. So for example, if someone has uh, depression, if someone has anxiety, someone has uh, made allegations that they are being picked on by everyone in the company, and we take into account black flags. Black flags are systemic and organizational factors. And one very good example of a black flag is a company that will not accommodate any modified duties for any of their workers if it's a personal injury. And if you are in the insurance uh, line of work for work cover, I'm sure you come across that all the time. So their employee employers will not take the risk that someone will show up at their site and an injury that was previously not work-related becomes work-related through aggravation or the person trips and falls and hurts something else. Um, and the problem with that approach is, even though it kind of keeps the company safe from a legal perspective, is that it worsens the outcome for the worker. It makes it harder for them to graduate back to work, you know, get, get the right mindset going, start building those muscles up again. So that's a black flag. When we do evaluations, I like to think that we do it through a lens of positivity. We are very strong trained to think about what a person can do and how they can do it. Uh, and that's important because you don't want, for example, a doctor saying to you in their report, well, this person has a knee problem, they need knee surgery, and they haven't had knee surgery yet, therefore there is no, no way they can do any work. That's, that's very unlikely to be true. And yet I'm sure you've probably come across reports that sound like this, right? And I'll give you an example of a case that I've just dealt with recently. It's an, an office worker who had photophobia, which is a fear of bright lights, not, not a psychological fear, but a sensation of pain or discomfort or intolerance to bright lights after he had cataract and glaucoma surgery. Now, this was the opinion from his treating practitioners, the GP and the ophthalmologist. His eyes hurt in office lighting, so he cannot work. That was their conclusion, that, that he just can't work. Right. My assessment was the workers got good visual acuity. Visual acuity is how sharp your vision is. And this is what I suggested to the employer. Why don't you measure the lux readings at the workplace? See how bright they are. Make sure they don't exceed the standards. And lo and behold, their lighting exceeded the standards. It was actually too bright. And I said, look, adjust it, aim for the lower end of the standards. When you look at the lighting standards in Australia, they give ranges for highly detailed work, computer work, office work, and the work that this person was performing could arguably be determined to fall in the 240 lux category or the 320 lux category. And I said, look, aim for 240 lux for this person. Try some other strategies like tinted lenses and there are a whole bunch of options, right? This guy started arguing back saying, well, I'm not gonna buy sunglasses every time my prescriptions change. And I said, that's not a problem. You can buy a clip-on attachment for your glasses and clip-on attachments cost a few dollars. You can have polarized lenses, which cl cuts up the glare of reflected light. You can have polychromatic lenses, which increase their tint as the lighting increases. And so, so if you go into a bright area, your glasses become darker. If you go into a dimmer area, the, the lenses become more transparent, more translucent. Uh, you can try a hat with a visor and you can take rest breaks for any work. And this guy then came back again with another argument saying, I don't like wearing tinted lenses and a hat in the office because people are going to laugh at me and they're gonna come up and ask me why I need these things, and I'm going to be embarrassed about it. And I said to the world, to the employer, in that case, you can run some timely cultural competency reminders and training 
people aren't supposed to be going around asking about you know injuries or illnesses or disabilities and then laughing at their co-workers so this is as you can see uh, a far cry from the approach of well if his eyes hurt he can't work okay. all right we've got a lot of industry specific knowledge i think and that is i think a very strong fact in why you would pick occupational medicine so Michelle, if it's okay, I might get you to unmute people and we'll see if people can interact a little bit, tell, tell me what they know and tell me what their opinion is. Sorry, Michelle, you're muted yourself. Sorry, okay. So if you scroll your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, the unmute button is at the bottom uh, left-hand side. It looks like an old fashioned microphone. There you go. So just click on it to unmute. Okay, well, we'll get started and no pressure. People can, you know, jump in and interact if they feel like it. If you feel like that you're not confident or you're not feeling like uh, uh, taking part today, that's perfectly fine. But basically, th this is the sort of knowledge that occupational physicians know that it is very unlikely that other people know, right? What's a counterbalance versus a reach forward? What are these two devices? Anyone have any idea? Michelle knows. Go ahead. What what what's what are these two things? So a counterbalanced forklift, as I understand it, has um, a, a weight on the back of it, which prevents it from tilting. Um, so that that whereas a reach forklift without a counterbalance. If the person extends the grabbing hand or the prongs or whatever they're using to move the pallet or the object and there isn't a counterbalance, there's a greater risk of the forklift tipping and falling. That is an excellent start. That covers a lot of it. That's not the entirety of it. And I will you know, show more as we go on, but that is a lot of it. Excellent. Uh, does anyone know what this task is throwing off onto V-frames? No, I'm, I'm not surprised. This one is truly one of the more obscure ones. Uh, anyone know what turning out or reclaiming plasma is? Again, very obscure. And anyone know what a boner or knife hand is? This one's easier. Yeah, that's an Michelle, abattoir Michelle. term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's an abattoir term. Uh, what injury did shipwrights keep getting when BAE was building naval ships? And you know, because if you're an insurance case manager, you might remember. Was it crushing injuries? It was um, meniscal tears. And oh, it, it was because course. shipwrights had to climb staircases on the scaffolding up onto these na naval ships. And the naval ships were huge. They were like three stories, five stories worth of staircases. And they were doing it repetitively all day long pivoting on very sharp turns around the stairs and they kept getting meniscal tears. What's a straddle? Anyone know? So if you've had a case where the, the person was a stevedore or dock hand, you might know. No, nobody? And last one, uh, I'm sure you guys know that these exist, but there are rail safety critical worker standards and there are commercial driver's licensing standards. And uh, unfortunately, not every doctor even knows this. So I have dealt with and picked up the pieces and fixed, case, fixed cases all the time where the doctors signed off on something that they shouldn't have, not realizing that there were standards to meet. Okay. All right, so I'll tell you a bit more about this stuff. So these are counterbalance forklifts. And they are what people immediately typically will think of when you say the word, word forklift. And exactly as Michelle has described, it's got the tines on the front, it's got a hidden weight on the back so that when the forklift picks up something heavy, it's not, not gonna tilt over, right? And this is a reach forklift. And what might not be immediately apparent is the seat on the counterbalance forklift faces forward Right, the wheels face this way, the tines face this way, and the seat faces this way. And note how high the tines can extend. They extend to about the height of the cabin. 
Now with a reach forklift, look at the chair. It's, it's facing this way. And the wheels actually face uh, in a perpendicular direction, 90 degrees. And the tines face in a perpendicular direction. And the height at which the tines extend to are above double the height of the cabin, right? Now, the implications of this is that if someone has a neck injury, can they operate a regular counterbalance forklift? There is, there's a pretty good chance that they can. But to operate a reach forklift all day long, these people go, turn to left, steer and drive off in that direction, and they turn to the right and then drive off that direction, and left and then right and left and then right all day long, as well as up and down, because look at how high these tines go. So they go up, down, up, down, left, right, up, down, left, right, all the time. And in fact, we've had people who operate reach forklifts come in with neck injuries because that's how that's how they got their neck injury, let alone you have a neck injury and you want to operate a reach forklift. Okay. So and, and if you don't know the difference between these two machines, you just go a forklift is a forklift, right? Who cares? But in occupation medicine, it's our business to know. Right. right. Uh, I couldn't even find a picture of V-frames. So V-frames are a specific type of rack that are manufactured specifically for Australia Post and Postal uh, services officers will stand at a V-frame every morning with a sack or stack of mail, and they'll do this and throw envelopes into the V-frame to be sorted. So that lasts a few hours every day. And again, if a you know postal service officer comes into you and says, oh, I, I hurt myself doing throwing off onto V-frame. So you're like, what's a V-frame? You can't even find a picture of this, that it's that obscure. Okay. The turning up or rec reclaim or reclamation of plasma task is specifically in the industry of human blood product. Okay. So human blood product is, is very, very valuable. So this stuff is plasma, right? It's been spun down, that's blood. And what happens is these things are frozen to make sure that they don't you know, um, get colonized by bacteria. So it's in a very cold environment. And when the product is being removed from these packets, the worker makes a cut and then they tip out all the product. And invariably what happened is what happens is little chunks of frozen plasma get caught in the corners and in these, these little bits here, these little tubes. And every little drop is like liquid gold and you just ignored it, it's pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars down the drain. So it is um, the specific job of a few workers to try and pry those little bits and pieces of frozen blood product out of these packets. And because it's so difficult to do, they have to very forcefully turn the packet inside out and press their thumb in there, and people get, kept getting carpal tunnel syndrome and the Corvin's tina sinusitis. And again, if you, if you don't know this task exists, uh, you don't know what it looks like, you're not gonna have any idea of what injury is typically associated with this task. And that's a straddle. That's a, it's called a straddle carrier or straddle crane. Some um, dock workers or stevedores would just say it's a crane, but it is a very specific machine because it actually drives around and picks up uh, loading containers. So it's not a stationary crane. I think I covered all of those little questions I put to you. Yep, bone knife hand is uh, an abattoir worker. And one specific thing about this particular job is that they tend to get carpal tunnel syndrome when there is actually very little evidence for occupational carpal tunnel syndrome in most other jobs, right? So if an office worker came to you and said, oh, I do a lot of typing and that's how I got carpal tunnel syndrome, if you are a non-occupational medicine doctor, you might very well say, oh yeah, that sounds reasonable. Uh, in occupational medicine, we recognize that this is not a thing, right? The evidence does not support the increased incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome in office workers who are just typing, but it does support the in increased incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome in things like boning and working as a knife. Right. So that's what I mean by 
industry specific knowledge. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you briefly about my own medical legal practice. I've done fitness for duty work, insurance determinations, plaintiff and defendant work, medical negligence work. My appointments are 90 minutes. So if you are an insurance case manager, you have probably heard a complaint from uh, a patient that you are managing saying, I, how can this doctor make this determination? I was only in there for five minutes. I can assure you that will never happen. My appointments are 90 minutes. I don't try and rush through them. And uh, another advantage of having an appointment that's 90 minutes long is the just sheer amount of detail that you can observe in 90 minutes. And you can spot a lot of inconsistencies in presentation. You can look at their function in sitting, recalling, thinking, talking, and handling their personal effects. And I can, you'll be shocked at the num sheer number of you know, examinees who come in with a limp uh, and come in, you know, clutching their back or something like that. And then after about 30 minutes, the limp disappears or the, the clutching disappears or their, their posture completely changes. It's because it's very hard to maintain certain behaviors that aren't necessarily super genuine in an anatomical or physical basis for an entire 90 minutes. I type my reports at the time of the consultation and I upload them on the same day. I know lots of insurance case managers struggle with doctors getting back to them with a report six months later. You'll never get that with me. Out of the hundreds or hundreds of reports I've done, I have never failed to upload my report on the same day. Right? With the special exception of, we, I've been asked to wait for something. Can you please wait for this investigation results or something like that? Besides that, I've always uploaded on the same day. The other useful thing about typing my reports at the same time is I am taking verbatim quotes, right? So if there's any conflicting account from the examinee, I can say to them, and they will have to acknowledge that it's true, that I typed right then as they were speaking. Right? Um, again, I, I type my own reports, so there's no waiting for dictation service either. So if there's a dictation service backlog, or you know, problems with dictation software or anything like that, it will never affect me. So you, you don't wait for any of this. I don't keep separate notes because I type my report immediately. So there will be no possibility of discrepancy if someone pulls up some records and says, why do these notes not match your report? And there'll be no handwriting for you to decipher, which I'm sure is the bane of everyone's existence, looking at doctor's handwriting. Uh, these are some of the highlights of my practice recently. I assessed an examinee who was referred for a back condition. And this examinee had actually been seen by their GP for about three years or so. They had already seen an orthopedic surgeon IME and another occupational physician IME. And all practitioners had missed that this person didn't actually have a back condition. What they had was a hip condition. And so finally, after she saw me and I wrote my report, we got her onto the treatment that she needed. Uh, I saw an examiner who'd been seen by another independent examiner only a few months prior, and reading through the referral letter, I couldn't understand why they'd been sent for another suspect so soon. Like nothing had really happened in between. But when I saw the examiner, I, I realized what was going on. Um, the physical issue was very, very secondary, and the primary driving force behind the presentation was psychological and psychiatric, and that's what they really needed. So the previous examiner had sort of talked around the subject without really addressing it because I guess they were you know, not comfortable confronting this. It, it takes you know, a certain amount of courage to say, this is what the real problem is. This person needs a psychiatrist. Right? Uh, but when I called up the client and said this is what I think that they were like yes that's that's what we needed we as non-professionals we are not doctors we could never say to this person we think you need a psychiatrist right so that was the hidden reason why they had been referred to me and they finally got what they needed which was to get this person some help uh, I've also attracted the attention of a federal client recently in, in a good way not a bad one I'll show you and they've given feedback that I write the very balanced reports, which is very important because 
they deal with opposition all the time. They have to answer to unions and lawyers constantly challenging their reports. And if you write a biased report, that's easily picked apart by the opposition. All right, so some simple tips, some do's and don'ts for your referral so that you can get the most out of what you want. Uh, provide a CV, a position description, and a job task analysis. A JTA, job task analysis, is a document that says things like this person sits for X amount of time, uh, stands for X amount of time, lifts up to 20 kilos, they do it, you know, uh, 20 times per minute, for example, give me investigation results. Objective evidence like that is always very, very useful. Do maintain your electronic compatibility if you can. So if you've got documents, try to avoid printing them out and then scanning them because then it changes from a text document into a picture of a text document, which means the document's no longer searchable, right? And it slows down the act of proofreading, checking, making sure that I've you know, read every MRI in, in your stack of documents and things like that. Use clear and concise language and apply qualifiers where you need to. If you want an answer specifically only about, let's say a right knee fracture, and you want to say, considering only the physical effects of the right knee fracture, you can tack on, right, disregarding the left knee, disregarding all psychological and psychiatric health issues. Add all of those if you need. I'm very happy for you to zone in on what you need. That makes my job easier as well. And that helps me to get the answer that you want. Don't provide irrelevant documentation. Some of the things that I've received in the past, things like pay slips, tax returns, GP records going back to childhood, uh, pamphlets, seriously, pamphlets, private and related emails, uh, duplicates of the same documents. The, the worst offender I've seen was a 3,000 page uh, attachment list and about 2,500 of those pages were copies of the original 500 pages over and over again. And it's, why would you do that? You're wasting my time, you're wasting your time. I have to bill you, and I have to very carefully go through all 3,000 pages to make sure there isn't like that one page in between that's not anywhere else. And don't ask subtly varied uh, versions of the same questions. This just confuses everyone. And if it's very obviously the same question, you will get a copy pasted answer because I wouldn't answer in a different way because that's gonna confuse you. And then you're gonna get annoyed because all I've done is copy paste my answer. So why, why do that? It doesn't benefit. All right, I've got some case studies. Now I see that we are uh, just above 30 minutes. So we are into 40 minutes. I'm happy to skip this. Uh, I think that these are really helpful and useful. Uh, anyone have any opinion on whether you'd like me to go through them quickly or? Do you I, I'd really appreciate you going through them. I think for the purposes of the recording, that'd be great. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's go through them quickly. Uh, this was an examinee that I saw a 40-year-old female kindergarten teacher. She had a stroke due to clots from a misplaced central venous catheter. So a little tube that goes up into a blood vessel in your neck. It went into the wrong vessel. It clotted up and the clots broke off and went into her brain and made her very, very ill. Uh, when she recovered from the initial effects and was discharged from ICU, um, she had ongoing issues with choking when she was eating and ongoing issues with falling. Her cognitive function was affected, so she required constant prompting for activities of daily living, such as hygiene and dressing. So if, you, if her husband didn't tell her it's time to take a shower, she would never go and take a shower. If she wasn't prompted to get dressed, she wouldn't know how to put on her clothes. She also spoke at an inaudible level, so when you talk to her, she will respond, but in such a low volume that you couldn't hear what she was saying. So her husband constantly had to say to her, you need to talk louder so that people can hear you. You need to talk louder so that people can hear you. And she did not know the answer to almost everything you asked her. So if you asked her, what happened? I don't know, when did it happen? I don't know, were you in hospital? I don't know, what's your condition? I don't know. She had normal gait and normal manual dexterity, and the, the SMMSE, standardized mental state examination, was 20 out of 30. 
which is moderate functional impairment. This is a quick screening check of your cognitive function. So can she perform her own occupation? Anyone have any opinions? Uh, absolutely not. If she's a kindergarten teacher for a number of reasons, um, and the first is the obvious one, the risk of falling. If she, she's falling and there are small children around, she could fall on the children. She could, um, obviously, that would be very distressing to children. Um, she wouldn't be able to pick up any smaller children that she might have needed to assist with tasks before because of that risk of falling, but also the risk of her, her inability to speak audibly and understand things yeah. make, makes her not suitable for that environment where you need to be constantly on the ball watching children. And there are specific legislative guidelines that, that govern early childhood that, that she would be unable to fulfil. Absolutely right. I, I doubt you're going to face any opposition from anyone here. This is a quick, simple case, right? Uh, I'm sure everyone agrees. This person does not have the cognitive or physical capacity to look after small children. Uh, she doesn't even have the cognitive or physical capacity to look after herself. Right? This person will require care for the rest of her life. Okay, so next one, a 48-year-old female office worker with severe osteoarthritis of hips, knees, and spine. She had uh, lower back and lower limb pain with sitting, standing, and walking. The BMI was 51 and she weighed 131 kilograms. When she came into the examination room, she mobilized with two elbow crutches. And even with the elbow crutches, she still needed her husband to prop her up. And she spent the entire time lying down on the consultation bench crying because it was too painful for her to sit up. Uh, it, was, it was too painful for her to do anything. At the time she was unemployed, she was engaged in the public health system. She didn't have any private health cover uh, and the household income could not afford any private medical care. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to whether she can perform her own occupation? Yeah, no. uh, yeah, Michelle again? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no. This, this is an Thank interesting you. one because yeah. there's a couple of issues. The the uh, hypermorbidity, uh, hyper obesity, sorry, is is one issue, mm. and pain is the second issue. But yeah. other than that, this person is an office worker, so my understanding is that the tasks she is doing would be predominantly desk related. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. so if she had, for example, a wheelchair. Hmm. then those issues of, of mobilising by walking with, a, with crutches would be eliminated firstly. Yep. And workplaces can be made wheelchair safe. Um, she could be engaged publicly with an exercise program, exercise physiology and, and dietitian advice to help her with managing her weight, which would immediately uh, reduce the back pain yep. and, and those other issues, back hip pain. Yeah. Um, so I would, I think she might actually, she may be able to return to some part-time work in a seated capacity with a wheelchair and some physio support. Yeah. You've actually raised some very, very valid points. And these are all things that I thought about when I examined this case. Uh, but ultimately, she found it intolerably painful to even sit up in a chair, uh, oh. which was problematic. That's why she was lying down on the exam oh, bench. Gee. The entire time uh, and then we look at well if, if it's so painful and it's because of osteoarthritis we could get in some strong painkillers but then that will, could start to affect her cognition what about losing some weight exactly as you said this person could not afford any sort of private service or gap fee right so yes maybe some public health dietitian entitlements but any gap fee and any additional on top of that was going to be a problem. Bariatric medicine was going to be a problem, right? For her to take a tablet to help her to lose weight, she couldn't afford it. Um, for her to actually get the hip and knee replacements that she was going to eventually need within a few years, that was probably because she couldn't afford it and she didn't have any private health insurance. And even the public system was not going to touch these things without her losing weight first. So she first needed to lose enough weight to get onto bariatric medicine under the public system and then lose enough additional weight 
to get into surgery of the hips and knees and then recover from the surgery. Now, that was easily a span of three years, five years, maybe 10 years. And we're counting on her succeeding at every step of the way, which people often don't. Uh, people often don't succeed in losing 20, 30 kilos of weight. Mm. Uh, and she had no benefit of funds or private health insurance. Um, we also don't do anything that like accuse people of lying. So if they're saying it's so painful that I cannot sit up, uh, I'm in tears with pain with trying to sit up, uh, I'm not going to go, I don't believe you. I'm going to certify that you can sit up. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to be provided evidence to the contrary. So if it turns out that there's video surveillance, look, we, we have, have filmed this person sitting up comfortably for two hours. I very happily act on that and go, well, based on this new evidence, I will revise my opinion. I think she can sit and perform office duties for two hours a day. But I don't make that sort of assertion without evidence. Okay. So a ver this is obviously a trickier one. Uh, and it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and speaking with other occupational physicians about as well. And there are no right or wrong answers in that what you said, Michelle, is not wrong exactly, right? That's, that's your opinion. It's just that uh, I have my opinion and I've got reasoning behind my opinion mm. as well. Okay. All right. Um, last one, and this is the trickiest one. A 53-year-old male assistant director at the federal government department who is a solicitor by training. Uh, he complained of hand and wrist pain, specifically with small movements since 1995. And he could tolerate only about 15 minutes of computer work. And his normal work is entirely computer-based. He did not have a diagnosis. So the doctors who'd seen him just said, oh, he's got some sort of regional pain syndrome, which is not an actual diagnosis. So if you look up DSM diagnostic, uh, the ICD, um, International Classification, Classification of Disease, you won't find that there. it's not a diagnosis. Right? Uh, his investigations are normal, so x-rays, ultrasounds, MRIs, everything normal. And when you examine him, you did, there was no findings. He had full normal range of motion, didn't have any muscle atrophy, didn't have any skin changes, nothing strange. So he had apparently coped with office work for many years using assistive technology. So instead of typing, he would dictate. But recently, the software ceased working properly. So when he dictated, it just wouldn't dictate. Uh, and he had gone to the software vendor and they could not fix it. He was able to cook, eat, tend to his own hygiene, room, drive, vacuum. He had hobbies which included yoga, calisthenics, calisthenics, meditation, indoor soccer, swimming, and he was still engaging in all of these hobbies. Can he perform his own occupation? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Absolutely. Um, that is a very reasonable uh, answer, but it goes back to what I said before, which is that if this person says, after 15 minutes of computer, I have too much pain, I'm unable to continue, I would not accuse them of lying. So I'm not going to say, I don't believe you, right? Uh, I will see what I can do to prove things. So for example, if I've observed that they have handled their uh, personal belongings in the consultation for 15 minutes and clearly are moving at a rapid pace, they've clearly disproven the history that they've declared, then I will act on that. But if I can't prove it, I won't toss out an allegation. Okay. So that was not my conclusion, but I don't blame anyone for thinking that. So my conclusion was that he could not perform his own occupation because his own occupation was entirely computer-based and he was only tolerating 15 minutes of computer work. But I didn't let it go at that. I said, first, let's try all the assistive technology we can. Let's try a touchpad. Let's try a different dictation software. I went back to the client and said, would you be able to afford a personal assistant for this person? If he can't type, can he talk to someone who types for him? Can we try a tape recorder or dic dictaphone? So we went through all of those things and before we concluded that, okay, 
we have exhausted every possible alternative assistive, all that sort of technology adjustments, everything, and we can't see a situation where he can go back to this sort of work, right? Is he totally and permanently disabled? Anyone? No, because there's obviously other things he could do that Absolutely. aren't computer-based. Absolutely. This, people get chipped up on this, right? And in fact, this person wrote a response to my report twice. He collated two reports that were each about 10 pages long uh, and collected supporting statements from his supervisor and colleagues and everything about why he is totally and permanently disabled. And he had really harped on the fact that, well, I can't do my own job, therefore I can't do any work, which is, of course, not true, right? Uh, this person's colleagues and direct supervisors were sort of supportive. HR was not impressed with what he was doing. As I said, he wrote up two reports. And it's interesting, isn't it? He wrote up two 10-page reports to essentially say that he is unable to write reports because that's his <laughs> job. Um, now, this was my conclusion at the end of the day. He may perform work within these following restrictions, no repetitive or fast-paced upper limb movements. And in response to his challenge, I said, I highlight the legislative criteria applicable for classification of total and permanent impairment, which you have provided to me, right? An example, an employee is unlikely to ever be, a, be able to work again in paid or unpaid, in unpaid employment for which he or she is reasonably qualified or could be reasonably qualified after retraining. They even have a clause for retraining. So he's not allowed to escape by saying, well, I haven't done that sort of work before, so I, I can't do it because he's allowed to retrain. Is unable to participate in any other employment with a government department or a non-government employer. And I reinforced it again, I draw your attention to the fact that the threshold under consideration is not original work or its equivalent in demands, structure, remuneration, prestige, or any other such factor. I'm satisfied that Mr. X does not meet criteria for TPI that you have cited, which I've been asked to base my conclusion on, right? So this is my verbatim wording from my report. So you can see my writing style. What other work could he have undertaken? Lots. I can't give an exhaustive list, but here's a few simple examples which he would not be happy with because nobody wants to go from assistant director to council crossing supervisor or swimming instructor or driver for a ride sharing program or taxi driver, luggage porter, hotel dorm and store assistant. He wouldn't want to do any of those. Could he work as a solicitor? Absolutely, because the federal department couldn't afford a personal assistant, but solicitors, I would say, sure can, right? Wouldn't you pay $40 an hour to protect your $600 an hour income? You probably would. Uh, and the PA could dictate, you know, take his dictation, type for him, uh, handle his computer work for him at, you know, a fairly small cost to the business. And in fact, many older doctors I know do exactly this. They don't want to learn computer skills. They don't want to type. So they get someone to do it all for them. So it's clearly feasible. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I apologize that we ran quite a bit over time. Hopefully that wasn't too draggy. And does anyone have any questions? Dr. Lee, that was terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, people, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask any questions, How are we going? Oh, thank you so much, says Helen in the chat. In my experience, Dr. Lee, when there aren't any questions, it's because the presentation was so good that you answered oh, everything they were going to so. ask I'm anyway. Sure I hope so. okay. Yeah, look, I, I, I learned a lot from that myself, even though I've been in this industry on the legal side and on the provider side for, for quite a while. So I'm going to say this is this has been a really terrific seminar. Thank and I'm, I'm so grateful that you made the time for that. If there's time, I do have one question. Go for it. Sorry. Um, just in relation to <clears throat> if uh, a worker already has a specialist on board and that specialist has said that, you know, say they've been, um, that they definitely can't work and potentially they may not have looked into the types of um, intricacies that you look into in, in your profession. Mm. Um, where, where do you stand to 
not overrule that, but given that they've already got a specialist on board, then how um, will that impact your assessments? I'm very happy to take into account any medical information that the specialist raises. Uh, but at the end of the day, my opinion is my own, and I'm not going to change it just because a specialist has said their, their piece, right? Uh, if they say uh, for medical reasons they, they cannot undertake this work because of this thing, I will definitely take that into account. But vocational prognosis, vocational capability, that's my role. I'm the specialist there, right? So I'll, I'll give an example uh, where I've taken into account the specialist opinion. And ultimately, I've decided to have the same opinion as the specialist. It was a very obscure blood uh, malignant disorder, so a type of blood cancer that didn't even have a name for it. It was like it was picked up on genetic mutation. And the specialist said, this person is severely immunocompromised. Here is all the evidence that they are severely immunocompromised. Here are the blood test results showing the very low white cell count and things like that. Now, if he, if he just said this person has a blood disorder, they can't work, I would not let it rest at that. But because he shown me the evidence to say that this person genuinely would be very severely immunocompromised, oh. I decided, yep, that is a reasonable argument. Right? Now, the other, an, an example of the opposite would be like what I cited in the presentation earlier about the GP and ophthalmologist saying, He's got photophobia, therefore he can't work. You know, the, he has pain in his eyes with bright light, therefore he can't work. I've said, I don't agree with that. Let's explore all of these other options. And ultimately, if he does these things, I believe this person can work. So I don't let them their, that opinion decide ultimately what I'm going to say, even though I take it into account. Great, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Well, we, we're going to need to wrap this up because, as we say, we have gone over time, but I believe it was well worth it. Dr. Lee, again, thank you so I'm, much for your time. I'm so sorry we jacked in for so long. Not even a question. Hopefully I don't think anyone here has a problem news. with that. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank Go and have a great rest everybody. of the day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.